Welcome back to What Happens Next, the podcast that examines some of the biggest challenges facing our world and asks the experts, what will happen if we don't change? And what can we do to create a better future? I'm Dr. Susan Carland. Keep listening to find out what happens next. We can, in fact, transition to renewable energy and, you know, still charge up our phones and our iPads and have that connectivity that we've come to know and expect. So when you're extracting these metals out of that, that means you're making environment safer and also cleaner in in a sense. At the same time, you're creating value out of um, uh, waste or wealth out of waste. Part of the challenge is that communities' identities are often tied to these jobs, these developments that are in their, in their towns. Uh, the exporting of our resources will continue to be important, but where possible, we should value add here. If you look at uh, so many of the rare earths and minerals that the world will need and will be in demand, we have a lot of them. Australia's first mines are tens of thousands of years old, formed by early Indigenous people who used minerals as pigments to create rock art and body paint. Within 10 years of the first fleet's arrival in the 18th century, coal was discovered in New South Wales, providing the colony with fuel for heating and cooking. According to the Australasian Mining History Association, lead and copper mining soon followed before the gold rushes of the mid-1800s made Australia's ore world famous. There are about 80,000 historical mining sites around the country and their cast-offs, tailings, mounds and dams are still there. But they're not waste any longer. As the world transitions to renewable energy, Australia's mines could once again be world famous. This time for the critical minerals and rare earth materials sitting right under our noses in those same tailings. Today on What Happens Next, we'll explore the opportunities afforded to us by these materials, as well as what it will take to pursue them in a socially and environmentally responsible way. Keep listening to find out what happens next. Mining for mainstream metals in Australia isn't going anywhere soon, says mining engineer Mohan Yelashetti, an associate professor at Monash University. Emerging technologies will rely heavily on the natural resources we have in abundance. For example, even you talk of uh, copper, now it has become so critical. Copper, uh, the demand for copper is forecasted to be very, very high in the next few decades because of electrification and, you know, all of these renewable energy technologies, which requires huge amount of copper and which is critical to many countries. For example, if you look at European Union, number of those countries require copper and uh, even coking coal, which is used in um, uh, metallurgical operations, many countries require that. For example, country like India, which is um, uh, on on the growth trajectory Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the GDP is growing massively. So they require huge quantities of metallurgical coal. Just to uh, give some examples of uh, how they can be in demand and not to mention the other important uh, materials like um, rare earth elements, platinum group of minerals, indium, cobalt, you know, lithium, all of them are going to be in hugely in demand in the next decades. Do you think Australia has the potential to become a a critical mineral or a green energy supplier, like the leading supplier, the superpower of the world? Absolutely. Um, uh, I think um, everything is nicely aligning. <laughs> you know, I've been working in this area for past, say, 10 years or so. I, I've been witnessing the growing um, sense of, you know, kind of what you call opportunity uh, in the country because we have all these resources and we also have got highest um, uh, environmental, social and governance systems in place compared to many other parts of the world. So which means, yeah, 
Australia sky is the limit uh, in terms of where, you, where we want to position ourselves in critical mineral space. And everyone is looking to have some kind of collaborations with the you know, Australian government and, and companies. Do you think we're seeing the level of federal government support for this kind of thing that we need for this to happen, for Australia to be a, a superpower in this regard? Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's yes and no. Uh, although we started a uh, little bit late, yes, I think uh, things are moving quite rapidly. For example, Geoscience Australia, through Geoscience Australia, still federal government invested some $225 million in into a program called Exploring for the Future. What essentially that particular program entails is to go back again, uh, do a bit of scanning of what exists in these discarded tailings. Mohan also points to the Australian federal government's critical mineral strategy, which includes a $2 billion facility established in 2021. The facility is aimed at helping junior and mid-tier companies get critical minerals projects off the ground quickly, as larger companies have been slow to take interest. This all leaves Australia in a very interesting position. With the potential of becoming a world leader in the shift to renewable energy, we have the chance to ensure that our transition is just, inclusive of our communities, respectful of the land's traditional owners, and as environmentally clean as mining can be. Hi, I'm Paris Hadfield. I'm a research fellow at Monash Sustainable Development Institute and my research looks at urban climate policy and governance, social innovation and renewable energy transitions in cities and beyond. Paris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Let's start by talking about what a just transition to decarbonisation looks like. Is it even possible? Well, I certainly hope it is. I mean, it, it's really about responding to uh, climate change and other environmental challenges in a way that focuses on uh, improving people's lives. They're ensuring their well-being, um, listening to their needs and priorities and aspirations, um, not only in the present but um, well into the future. And I guess in an Australian context, we often talk about or hear about tr just transition um, associated with coal communities. So yeah. how can we um, ensure that they continue to thrive without jobs and economic um, out uh, benefits of coal mining? Um, but what um, we've recently done in our research is to kind of broaden that concept and think about how uh, climate solutions uh, can really uh, address issues around distribution of costs and benefits, thinking about who is involved in decision making, um, and also recognising existing inequalities. Mm. So if you were going to plan the ideal just decarbonisation panel, mm. what kind of people would you put on there? Gosh, I think um, maximum representation is, is really important. It's certainly not something that experts uh, in universities um, like myself and others uh, and not only politicians as well as decision makers, um, these kind of elite groups can't decide what a just transition is going to be for people. So I think uh, a place-based approach is really useful to think about, okay, who is in this community? Um, how can we empower them to be involved? Um, so that might be, you know, local community groups, uh, local council, um, uh, schools, um, and certainly things like First Nations um, groups, uh, traditional owners' corporations, things like that, unions. So really it's about bringing everyone together, mm. um, getting on the same page, uh, transparently deliberating on these difficult questions. Imagine that we are proceeding with a just decarbonisation model. What are some of the details, the finer examples of, of how that would actually look for an Australian society? Sure. I think at least um, drawing a bit on my research in renewable energy transitions, um, it's thinking about things like um, how, uh, what are the different uh, access issues around, for example, solar. Mm. Um, we can see that there's a, a disparity in who has solar on their roofs, for example. Um, there are cost barriers. Uh, and so it's thinking about um, how can we uplift the most vulnerable groups in our communities? Um, what would help them also access solar, for example? Um, and then thinking about also the regulations, 
um, how costs are managed in our energy network. It's very uh, complex arrangement, and I think just directing and prioritizing investment to say that we're not going to leave people behind, I think is a key part of it. Obviously, the inequalities can come and do come from uh, being coal or mining focused, um, you know, the impact on the environment and all that sort of thing. What could be some of the inequalities that could emerge in a decarbonisation process? Mm. And could they be different communities or different groups that are affected? Yeah, sure. And that's part of the kind of the set of principles around just transition. It needs to recognise spatial difference, so inequalities between places as well as within a place um, and within a group of people. So, um, for example, thinking about uh, large-scale renewable energy uh, developments um, where they don't adequately um, uh, negotiate with traditional owners, for example, um, they, this can bring up and kind of repeat the problems of the past. Um, so we can see, for example, um, ANU researchers have developed kind of best practice um, agreement making um, based on the UN um, uh, free prior and informed consent principles. And so there are kind of, there's no clear example of something that has worked really well, I don't think, um, but we can learn from the past. And for example, in that case, uh, traditional owners corporations need to have uh, the capacity to negotiate on an even, um, an even playing field because um, we're talking about large energy and mining corporations. Um, but we can see certainly the uh, recently um, established First Nations Clean Energy Network um, and they've just in the last week uh, received commitment from um, energy ministers, federal, state and territory energy ministers um, to develop a First Nations clean energy strategy. Mm -hmm. So that's a really great first step, at least a, a commitment to centering the opportunities for uh, First Nations groups to uh, lead the clean energy transition on their lands um, and also be part of the or be, to benefit from it essentially. And is there anywhere around the world that you can point to that has done a really good equitable job of proceeding on decarbonisation or is it too difficult or too early? It's a it's a good question. I I kind of I like to come back to a local example actually. Um, it was a a council scheme here in Melbourne mm. and they developed an interest-free uh, financing program for pensioners to get solar on their roofs. And, of course, solar is its not very um, uh, exciting anymore. A lot of people have solar, but that program was really innovative in recognising and working around um, how to help pensioners who don't have a lot of um, income but they would benefit from having uh, renewable energy a cheaper electricity during the day, they can stay warm or cool um, in their homes. And that scheme has really expanded and um, through local government networks across Victoria and with state government funding has really scaled up. So that's, I think, a really um, great success story in an innovative um, social program that had climate change as like the, f the key driving force. So what about the miners themselves? In 2021, Australia's massive mining sector employed about 270,000 people, approximately 2% of our total labour force. A just transition to a decarbonised future can't leave them behind either. Here's Mohan again. Coal is a massive employer in Australia. We have a lot of people working in that area. How easy would it be for those people to um, be retrained and, and work in mining or working in the critical minerals area? Is it an, a, a natural transfer? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, coal is very big industry. But again, within the coal also, what we must understand is there are two different types of coal. One is, you know, the thermal coal, which is going to go down uh, over time. Um, but one, the coal, the other coal, which is metallurgical coal, you know, the demand for that will continue to grow which is very important when it comes to, you know, for example, steel making. Mm -hmm. we, we still use metallurgical coal. 
although we are talking of green steel and uh, other uh, areas and hydrogen is another potential energy source, uh, we will continue to use um, uh, coking coal for some time into the future. And coming to your second question, um, you know, whether skills are transferable, I say yes, because the way that you undertake mining is pretty much the same, you know, whether it's open cut or underground. Uh, but the complexity, um, the nature of mining and the specifics of it would vary from one particular commodity to other. And that's exactly, you know, as a mining academic at the university, we, we teach our students uh, the basic mining skills. Some of them end up working for coal mining and some work in the, uh, you know, the metal, me metal mining industry. But you know they do. I, I do see that they keep moving from uh, one side to other, so without any hassle. That means you know the basic skills that you acquire in the mining industry are pretty much transferable. Ultimately, all of this effort to find the critical minerals that will enable us to transition to a decarbonised future is to help save the planet. What about the environmental impact of mining itself? Here's Professor Susan Park, a global governance expert at the University of Sydney. And are there any environmental concerns with the extraction of these rare earth minerals? Like in our um, eagerness to, to start using these rare earth minerals to get us to a more renewable uh, energy supply, are we causing harm by trying to get these things out of the ground or out of the sea or wherever they are? Absolutely. So this, again is an issue of extraction. The, 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 the issue is that um, no matter which type of energy we use, we are going to have an impact on, on the earth. And that impact can be direct and immediate in terms of the actual mining site uh, where we, uh, we, and by that I mean mining companies on whom we depend for these, uh, for these minerals and metals, um, might push people off their, off their communal lands. Uh, we've seen that with lithium extraction in the lithium ion triangle in Argentina, uh, Bolivia and Chile. Um, the extraction process is also uh, quite intensive and can have significant environmental impacts. Um, the lithium extraction process in Latin America is based on um, a heavy reliance on water to be able to separate the lithium uh, from, 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 from rock and from, from the soils. Um, so that water then becomes toxic. That toxic water then goes into the agricultural processes for farmers in the local area. That then enters the human body. Uh, there are concerns about the impact on human health, including thyroid and kidneys. Um, these are just some of the um, quite significant environmental and health impacts that come from the extraction of these particular minerals, but bearing in mind that extraction is always um, has an impact. So we have to, and, and what the engineering field has done is look at what they call the life cycle analysis, which is to take into account the impact of extracting these minerals and metals compared to the extraction of fossil fuels. So coal, oil, gas, these are the ones we know, right? Uh, and in actual fact, um, what they've tried to do is to look at, well, if you extract for solar, right, you're using all these critical minerals, some of the ones that, uh, that I've just listed, if you're extracting that out, can we compare like for like? And so what they've done is to try and identify how much carbon you are saving in extracting for renewable energy compared to if we just continued on our current path. And so we can by far and away identify that it is much more <laughs> worthwhile for us to have a habitable planet to be able to extract these critical minerals for wind and solar and lithium-ion batteries than to keep continuing on the path that we're on. So that's trying to put in context that there are always impacts, there are some known consequences there are some unknown consequences and we do need to be mindful about how we can extract because some of these issues like we know about right we know about safe disposal we know about 
how we should engage with local communities in terms of free, prior and informed consent. So in terms of extraction, we just need to do it better. To Mohan, it's a matter of turning waste into wealth. Is extracting critical minerals from the ground similarly damaging to the environment as it is for coal or is it actually a a much less dramatic process? So, as I said, many of these critical minerals that we are talking today, they form as, they come as companions to the major metals. So, as you undertake mining for majors, Mm. uh, so you are not specifically doing any specific minings, uh, for example, to extract these, but rather you uh, de- uh, they come as derivatives of uh, you know, mainstream metals. Not only that, uh, worldwide there's a lot of uh, lot of consciousness that has come through, and wherein people are now going back and looking at some of the old tailing stamps. Like when when tailings are those discarded products. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's take example of gold. Uh, typically. If you get a ton of rock out of the ground, maybe you get, you're lucky to get 10 grams of gold. The rest of all is going to end up in tailing stamp, which is a very fine ground, talcum powder consistency, consistency kind of material, which will end up in, in some of these. So the, the way that currently world is looking at critical minerals is, okay, can we go back and then remine the tailings yep. so that one, you are making the tailings more environmentally benign because some of these metals which whose impacts are yet to be uh, well documented, they already are there. They are highly reactive and you know they would potentially contaminate groundwaters and surface waters and then also cause a lot of environmental nuisance in terms of air pollution. So when you are extracting these metals out of that, that means you are making environment safer yeah. and also cleaner in, in a sense. At the same time, you are creating value out of um, uh, waste or wealth mm. out of waste. So yeah, it is a multitude of uh, benefits, uh, not only in terms of you know the monetary value, but also employment and also the environment safeguard. Mohan, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. Green mining is a dirty business, but ironically, our sustainable future depends on it. The technology of tomorrow that will release us from our reliance on fossil fuels can't exist without mining. But as we begin to transition to a decarbonised future, we can work to ensure it's a just one that keeps the planet and all its people in mind. This concludes our series on critical minerals. Thanks for joining us. Thanks also to all our guests on this series, Dr. Paris Hadfield, Dr. Mohan Yalashetti and Dr. Susan Park. For more information about their work, visit our show notes. Our sources for today's episode are also available there. If you're enjoying What Happens Next, don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and share the show with your friends.